So yeah, it's not talking about continual confession like Catholics. Right, that's funny. Catholics agree with Jack Smack. Here's a video clip from Jack Smack. Hey, the day a Catholic agrees with you, it should tell you that you're completely amiss, completely wrong, completely demonic. Just thought that was funny. Catholics believe in, a, in being in a state of grace. Last time I checked, you do that by going to confession to remain in a state of grace. Isn't this practically the same thing? You're confessing your sins to remain in a state of fellowship. That's literally the same thing. You're trying to earn grace. You're trying to earn fellowship. That's law. Grace is unmerited favor. And if it's not grace, then it's law by default. There's only grace and law. No, the fellowship is when you believed in the gospel. John himself tells us that truly our fellowship is with the Father. This continual fellowship BS is exactly that. Stupidity. I'm sure Jack lost his fellowship in this video and every other video where he called someone stupid or a fool. You stupid unsaved devil! You stupid bastard! Let him be accursed! Let him go to hell! Says the Apostle Paul. Look at all the people he deceived, okay? I'm glad he's burning in hell right now. Why would somebody want a stupid blasphemer to be in heaven when all he did was reject the Bible? Turn over to John chapter 6. And that's exactly where this unsaved, stupid bastard, praise I am, is going straight to the pits of hell, stupid devil. Jesus said if you call someone a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. I sure hope Jack confessed his sins to God to remain in a state of grace. They are constantly talking about the Galatian error. The Galatian error has two parts. Salvation by law, the work salvationists, the most obvious form. The second is more subtle. 99.9% .9 of Christendom has fallen for. Live the Christian life by law. Okay, this sermon is entitled, Jack Smack 77 is a buffoon open up with prayer and then with a few verses right there god thank you for giving us your clear word thank you for allowing us to see what it says bless the listeners i ask all this in jesus name amen isaiah 36 12 reads <laughs> but rapsheka said hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? So Jack Smack made a video titled, What is the Hypergrace Movement? He made this video about three weeks ago now, you know, as I'm making this video. But when this video came out, I was going to make a video about it. I just never did. I lost interest, I guess. But since he's been doubling down and attacking our position, strawmanning us... I figured it was time to make a video about it. So we're gonna listen to this video and break it down. Here goes. Okay, this sermon is entitled, What is the Hyper Grace Movement? Like to open up with prayer and then with a few verses. Dear God, I just do. Now recently, I've discovered that there's a movement out there called Hyper Grace, and I always thought that Hyper Grace was just a synonym for free grace. Yeah, I thought hyper grace and free grace were the same exact thing. You know, Jack Smack in his videos, he would uh, use hyper grace and free grace interchangeably. So I just figured, you know, it just meant the same thing. Okay, this sermon is entitled, Without Hyper Grace, We'd All Go to Hell. I'd like to open up with prayer. But then a bunch of uh, quote unquote free gracers started to plague my Discord server telling me how I'm not free grace. I'm actually hyper grace. They were complaining and moaning about that. And to me, hyper grace just means you're saved by grace through faith, which is what free grace, the free gracers agree with. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But here's where we disagree. The Christian life is lived by grace through faith. What's that mean exactly? Well, what does grace mean? Unmerited favor. And what does faith mean? It means you acknowledge the word of God. You trust in what God's word says. 
So if you live the Christian life by grace through faith, this just means you acknowledge all the truths that are in the gospel. The gospel does not just include going to heaven when you die. The gospel includes every spiritual blessing. You know, that Jesus is your advocate when you sin. That you can come boldly to him in time of need. That he is not ashamed of you. You're no longer a slave. You're actually a son and an, and an heir. You are complete in Christ. You lack nothing. And these free gracers, they don't believe any of that. Because they're living by law, clearly. And we'll see that in a minute here. And I always thought that hyper-grace was just a synonym for free grace. That it was tantamount to the doctrine of free grace theology, meaning that God's grace is hyper-abundant, it's copious, and it never runs out. But evidently there's another movement out there, known as hyper-grace, which is slightly different from free grace. What exactly is this hyper-grace movement? Well, according to several websites, Hypergrace is this teaching that basically posits that we're saved by grace, which I agree with wholeheartedly, but they also teach that there's no need for any type of Christian service. In other words, they teach no discipleship, no need for 1 John 1 9, no chastisement, no rewards in heaven, and that everyone has an equal status in heaven. So a few straw mans in here. Hypergrace, quote unquote does teach service. The point is, how do we go about it? Uh, he mentioned discipleship. So he's referring to the various discipleship verses found in the Synoptic Gospels, like take up your cross and follow me. That's not for us today. Today it's Galatians 2 verses 19 through 20. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Take up your cross. Hey, hey I'll give you an even better alternative. I'm crucified with Christ. I've gone a step further. I'm not taking up my own cross. I've already been crucified on my cross by grace. So I guess this is just another example of law versus grace, to put it simply. Taking up your cross represents the law, but I am crucified with Christ represents grace. It's impossible to be a disciple according to the law anyway. No one is a disciple according to the law. If you haven't forsaken all that you have, you're not a disciple. And of course, the free gracers will try to dance around this fact. They downplay God's standard as every legalist does. But yes, if you haven't forsaken all that you have, you're not a disciple, according to Jesus. So yeah, that's my answer to that. The discipleship when Jesus was around, by law, it was take up your cross. It was a burden. The discipleship today, under grace, it's I am crucified with Christ. What's that mean? It means I am condemned by the law. I am condemned to the cross. All my sinful and my quote-unquote good religious zeal, according to the flesh, has been crucified. All of it I count as dung. I'm wanting to learn the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and for Christ to live in me, so that Christ may be magnified in my mortal body. Again, God didn't just condemn our sinful flesh. He condemned the good so-called the good religious flesh too. If that offends you, then you have a problem. You don't think you're that bad. You think you're pretty good. Yes, of course my sins were condemned, but surely not my religious service. Surely not my religious zeal as well. It was. You need to realize that we're all just unprofitable. That's the flesh. It is unprofitable. There is none good, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeks after God. No, not one. All are gone out of the way. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. We're of no use. So that's quote-unquote discipleship for today. I am crucified with Christ, not taking up my cross. And I'd stay away from using that term, discipleship. Uh, let's see, and then he says, no need for 1 John 1.9. Now, this is true. There's no need for 1 John 1.9. 1, 
and the way that him and others interpret it. I made a few videos on 1 John, made a video about this confessing sins verse, but what this verse means, it's just, it's just talking about confessing you're a sinner. Are you a Christian? I am a Christian. So Marcus, this is by your own admission, I'm not judging you. You're, no. a, you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, sure, an yeah. adulterer at heart, and a fornicator. Yeah. So you're not you a good that. person. No, I guess you could say that. Your heart I don't is deceitfully that. wicked. Sorry, that's what it says in the Bible. But so yeah. if you were to die today... I would go to heaven because I am a born-again Christian. Tell me why Jesus died on the cross. For our sins and to let everybody who believes in him go to heaven. Well, the devil believes in him. Hitler believed in him. A lot of people believe in Jesus, but they haven't repented and trusted in him. Marcus. Saints don't boast like the Antichrists who say they have no sin. I repented of all my sins. Who says that? Ray Comfort, work salvationist, antichrist. Forsake your sins. Don't say I'm a Christian, but you fornicate and lie and steal and blaspheme. That's playing a hypocrite. Well, I'd never do that. I fear you God. You never do any of that. No, I'm a Christian. You've never done it. No, but if I fall, I get up. It's not deliberate. I don't deliberately <laughs> sin. Well, it's where you turn from all sin. It's something you continually do. I'm a Christian, and I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't fornicate. I don't commit adultery. It's something I don't do because I don't want to play the hypocrite and just deceive myself. So you've got to be genuine in your repentance. So that means you turn from lying, stealing, fornication, blasphemy, homosexuality, anything you see in the Bible that God says is morally wrong. Is this making sense? First John was written for believers and to also warn them of antichrists among them. Confess, used here in verse 9 in the Greek, is homologale. To say the same thing as another. To agree with. Assent, to concede, not to refuse, to promise, not to deny, to confess, declare, to confess, to admit or declare oneself guilty of what one is accused of. That's all this means, to acknowledge you're a sinner. No. You're a lying thief, a blasphemer, sure, an yeah. adulterer at heart, and a fornicator. Yeah. I have already acknowledged I'm a sinner. That was back when I believed in the gospel. That's why I believed the gospel out of fear of going to hell for my sins. I acknowledged I was a sinner and I was cleansed from all unrighteousness. That's another that uh that's another thing. According to this interpretation, you know, Jack Smacks, you're not cleansed of all unrighteousness. It's a continual cleansing of unrighteousness. Not true. So yeah, it's not talking about continual confession like Catholics. Right? That's funny. Catholics agree with Jack Smack. Here's a video clip from Jack Smack. Hey, the day a Catholic agrees with you, it should tell you that you're completely amiss, completely wrong, completely demonic. Just thought that was funny. Catholics believe in, a, in being in a state of grace. Last time I checked, you do that by going to confession to remain in a state of grace. Isn't this practically the same thing? You're confessing your sins to remain in a state of fellowship. That's literally the same thing. You're trying to earn grace. You're trying to earn fellowship. That's law. Grace is unmerited favor. And if it's not grace, then it's law by default. There's only grace and law. No, the fellowship is when you believed in the gospel. John himself tells us that truly our fellowship is with the Father. This continual fellowship BS is exactly that. Stupidity. I'm sure Jack lost his fellowship in this video and every other video where he called someone stupid or a fool. You stupid unsaved devil! You stupid bastard! Let him be accursed! Let him go to hell! Says the Apostle Paul. Look at all the people he deceived, okay? I'm glad he's burning in hell right now. Why would somebody want a stupid blasphemer to be in heaven when all he did was reject the Bible? Turn over to John chapter 6. And that's exactly where this unsaved, stupid bastard, praise I am, is going straight to the pits of hell. Stupid devil. Jesus said if you call someone a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. I sure hope Jack confessed his sins to God to remain in a state of grace. And I'm not attacking him. I'm attacking the doctrine. To show how stupid it is. Paul didn't teach it and Paul was the man for all things concerning Christianity. And John didn't teach it either. Because that wasn't what he was getting at. Anyway. To confess your sins again. 
It just means you acknowledge you're a sinner. You're not like the Antichrist who say they've repented of all their sins. Uh, going on to chastisement. Jack says there is no chastisement. This is also a straw man. There is a chastisement, but it's not God taking you out to the woodshed to beat the f*** out of you. It's a correction, a training done for our own good. All things work together for our own good. Chastisement in the book of Hebrews, the Greek word is paideia. The whole training and education of children. So how does God train you? I'd argue it's to run to Jesus in every situation, to be bold. If you just sinned, you run to Jesus. Mad all day? Run to Jesus. Jesus Christ is the physician. We are the ones who are sick. Sick people go to physicians, not run away from them. If you break your arm, you run to the hospital. In the same way, when you sin, you run to the, you run to the physician to help in time of need. You don't try to fix your arm and then go to the hospital. What good does that do to you? You don't confess your sins and then go to Christ. What good is that to you? You don't need him. You're good. You confessed your sins. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Chastisement is a training. Notice you also can't escape God's chastisement. This cruel chastisement is seen as something to avoid. Which literally... Jack Smack argues for that you can avoid chastisement later in this video. Confess their sins and use 1 John 1 9. If they want to be a disciple, if they want to earn rewards and avoid chastisement, and avoid chastisement, and avoid chastisement. Quit sinning to not get chastised, to not get taken home early. No, the Bible says all sons get chastised. If ye endure cha ch chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. You can't escape the chastisement. If you're not chastised, you're a bastard and not a son. So all sons get taken home early for their sins? stupid. Now you could say, well, what about the few times God killed Christians? That was during a different time. That was during the times of the apostles, while the church was being built up. So supernatural stuff had to occur. If this cruel chastisement were true, uh, if God uh, actually did that, he, he'd take out billions of Christians today with all the mess going around, all the wicked heresy out there. And during that time of the apostles, uh, when God killed Christians, it wasn't the norm. I mean, only a handful of times it happened. So, yeah. Chastisement is a training. Next. Uh, no rewards in heaven. Everyone has an equal status in heaven. Uh, this is a straw man as well. There is a reward, uh, but it's based on grace. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul worked more than anyone. Yet yeah, notice what he says. Yet yeah, not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul credited all his labor to God, to God's grace. It was nothing in Paul that made him work. It was purely out of God. It was a supernatural working of God. That's how we live the Christian life. And then in 1 Corinthians 3.10, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another build buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So salvation is based on grace, Christian living is based on grace, and of course the reward has to be of grace as well. You know, Mary is another example. Mary was highly favored of God. What is that? That is unmerited favor. That's grace. Did Mary do anything? Did she work real hard to earn to be able to be a Jesus' mother? No, it was, it was purely out of God's kindness. That's it. 
there wasn't anything in Mary that God chose her. And, uh, is there an equal status in heaven? Well, again, it's based on grace. Jesus equated the greatest in the kingdom to a little child. Now, what's a little child? Uh, unwise, uh, good for nothing, needs guidance in every aspect of life, can't survive on their own. Uh, yeah, that's the greatest in the kingdom. But not according to the world. The greatest in the world, it's the strong, right? The athletes, the wise, the mighty, the fast. You know, survival of the fittest. That is such a worldly, philosophical way of interpreting the Bible. But as, as we all know, the Bible is totally flipped on its head. The Christian life is lived in, in, is lived in dependence and weakness, not in strength and independence. If you think that Christians that just work the hardest through their own strength are going to be the greatest in heaven, uh, you got another thing coming. The first will be last, and the last will be first. I mean, how many times does the Bible have to condemn man's strength, man's work, for these people to get this? Right? You got Cain and Abel. You got Abraham when he went into the bondwoman, representing, representing the law. He went into her through his own strength, producing Ishmael, born of the flesh. Instead of waiting on God, giving up all hope in his flesh, waiting on God to do the super to do the supernatural work through him and Sarah because they were old. I mean, they couldn't have children according to the natural way of thinking. God has had to do all the work so Isaac could be born. God had to give life to Abraham and Sarah's mortal body. They just had to wait. That's how we live the Christian life. We wait on God to work, not take things into our own hands and get busy. Of course, legalists won't, won't get this. They'll just call you lazy looking for a license to sin while they're out in the field like Cain and the elder brother, right? The elder brother in the prodigal son parable. You got Martha who, who kept serving and working while Mary was just being quote unquote lazy, focusing on Jesus. You got the 11th hour laborer parable where Jesus equates the kingdom to a householder that went out to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. The ones who were working all day out in the field received the same wage, the same pay, as the ones who worked for an hour. The ones who were working all day were mad at the good men of the house for doing that. They believed they should have gotten paid more for all their labor. What's that? That's equal status. Again, Paul labored more than anyone, but it wasn't him. It was God at the end of the day. Any good we do that's counted as reward, it was ultimately God doing it through us. It wasn't in our own strength. Our strength is wood hand stubble. Alright, so finally, going on with this video from Jack Smack. And that everyone has an equal status in heaven, and not only do these people underemphasize these things, but it seems like they de-emphasize them as well. And once again, when it comes to salvation, the only thing required is faith alone in Christ alone. Salvation is not of works, lest anyone has the right to boast. Yeah, you're going to heaven when you die, but now get to work as a slave for the rest of your life. Live by law, earn fellowship with God, try your hardest not to sin so God won't take you out early. This is on par with practically every false religion. Don't sin, do good works. That's the mindset of every other religion. There's nothing special in that. Christianity is not like every other religion. There's power in the Christian life. You literally have Christ living in you. We are to live as sons and heirs, not slaves. I've heard it best said, we're spoiled rich kids in Jesus. But the question is, do you know that? I work whenever I want. As of recent, I'm waiting on God to get to work to give me the thirst to get working, to preach on whatever comes to mind. The goal is to no longer force myself. I'm just, wet, I'm just resting and waiting on God, growing confident in my stance with Jesus, agreeing with all the truths I have in Him. And again, legalists won't understand this. The legalist doesn't know how to rest. They just want to work and work and work and work and labor and labor and labor. When works is the reason Christianity is in the mess it's in right now. Ironically. You know, like Mormonism, Catholicism, 
Jehovah's Witnesses, what's that? That's man's work, a restless conscience, an evil heart of unbelief. Same with lordship salvation and every other religion. This includes the free grace position. Man's work messes everything up. Lest anyone has the right to boast. But see, the problem with this hyper-grace movement is that these people make no distinction between the position of the believer and the believer's experience. There's no such thing. All this is is just wordplay and traditions of men. It's also a subtle way to put you under bondage to the law, whether they realize it or not. Romans 5.1 reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is this positional or experiential? The free gracers would say this is positional. Positionally, you're at peace with God. You're going to heaven when you die. Right? Positionally, you're already in heaven. So positionally, you have peace with God. But experientially, throughout your daily life, you can lose peace with God. So you're telling me I must earn peace with God. You're telling me to live by law, not by faith. Which is exactly what the Bible teaches. The just shall live by faith. You either believe this verse or you don't. As a believer, do you know you have peace with God, yes or no? If your answer is yes, then you're persuaded in what the Bible says is true. You're living by faith. If your answer is no, then you are not persuaded. You are not persuaded what the Bible says. You are not living by faith. You have an evil heart of unbelief. You're living by law. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I know I have peace with God. I'm standing in grace. But the question is, do you realize this? ...of the believer and the believer's experience. And they say stupid things like, we don't need to confess our sins to be right with God. Jesus made us right at the cross. This is wild to me. Uh, this is something I could see a lordshipper saying, you know, mockingly saying Jesus made us right at the cross. You know, the lordshipper would mockingly say, you don't need to repent of your sins at the cross. Jesus already made us right at the cross. Or we don't need to be sanctified in our experience. We were sanctified by Jesus once and for all. Hebrews 10.10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10.14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's positional. All right, pick up your shovel and get to working with Cain and the other son to earn your feast. I'm going to be inside the buffet with my feet up eating for free and we do need to be quote-unquote sanctified in our experience but i think i prefer mind renewal paul does exhort us to renew our mind renew our mind on what on all the truths you have in jesus to acknowledge everything you have in him that you have peace with god that he is for you to have boldness he is your advocate when you sin that's mind renewal this is commonly called preaching the gospel to yourself. But this quote-unquote sanctification the free gracers preach is just like the sanctification of every other false religion. Don't sin, do good works. Again, nothing special with that, and there's no power behind it. That's the world's sanctification, a Christless sanctification, a law-based sanctification. When Jesus Christ is our sanctification. We were sanctified by Jesus once and for all. They claim that earning rewards leads to bragging. Earning rewards done in your own strength, 100% would leave room for boasting. And you cannot say otherwise. Work salvationists themselves, right now, they say they won't be bragging about their salvation. And yet the free graces would all agree that they're part of the crowd who are bragging in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Right now, everyone is going to say till blue in the face that they're not going to brag. But once Judgment Day hits, the truth is going to come out. No flesh will be able to glory for their salvation or for their service. If there's room for bragging in salvation, Matthew 7, 21 is likely your fate. 
If there's room for bragging and service, you're going to experience loss. Wood, hay, and stubble. This leads to bragging, and they accuse people who promote Christian service as being work salvationist. They also claim that we live our Christian life by grace, not by law. Yep. Uh, Paul lived by grace. The just shall live by faith, not by law. The law is not of faith. And they are constantly talking about the Galatian error. The Galatian error has two parts. Salvation by law, the work salvationist, the most obvious form. The second is more subtle. 99.9% .9 of Christendom has fallen for. Live the Christian life by law. Galatians 3, starting verse 1, reads, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? They began in the Spirit... They're going to heaven when they die, quote-unquote. But now they try to perfect their flesh by the works of the law. They're trying real hard not to sin. That is Galatian error. Then going to verse 11, But that no man is justified but the law on the side of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Is this talking about salvation or living? It's talking about living. The just shall live by faith, not law. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. The just shall live by faith. C.I. Schofield has a good commentary concerning Galatians. Like I said, Galatian error is not just work salvationist. It's also living by law and not by faith. They're constantly talking about the Galatian error, and they accuse pastors of beating the sheep. Well, yeah. Pastors are the number one problem when it comes to destroying a believer's confidence. You're not right with God. You better quit your sin and get working when they themselves are working for the devil. Right? Luke 12, 45 reads, But and if that servant... Notice this isn't talking about believers. Believers are sons and heirs, not servants. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. That's the fate of most pastors. The sheep. Now, once again, I agree with everything they're teaching regarding salvation. But see, after a person is saved, they have a choice as to how they want to live. If a Christian is serving God, thinking that gets them right with God, they're trying to earn fellowship, they're the other son working out in the field. If a Christian serves just because they have a thirst for that, then I'd say that's the Holy Spirit leading them. What we don't do is try to force people to serve God, threatening them with punishment if they don't, or call them stupid or lazy. Yes, of course you have a choice to serve God, but if you don't want me to call you stupid or lazy, you better get to working like me. Right, that's Jack Smack's attitude. It's toxic as hell. So get to work or be called stupid. Those are your only two options. As to how they want to live. And one of the dumbest things I've heard these people claim is that 1 John 1, nine was not given to believers. It was for unbelievers. That's a straw man. I don't know where he got this from. Like I said earlier, 1 John was written for believers and to also warn them about Antichrist. 1 John 1, nine is for believers. If we confess our sins, if we acknowledge we are sinners and believe the gospel, we are cleansed of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.8 is for Antichrist. That's not talking about believers. 1 John 1.6 is also describing Antichrist. All the negative passages throughout 1 John, it's talking about Antichrist. Right? Like 1 Corinthians 6.9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, is this verse describing believers or unbelievers? Unbelievers. That's the same concept all throughout 1 John. Right, 1 John 1, 6. If we say, right, if someone among us says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
1 John 1 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 1 John 2 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2 9, he that saith, he's in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness, even until now. 1 John 4 20, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? All those passages are describing Antichrist among us, not believers. It was not given to believers. It was for unbelievers, which makes no sense at all because 1 John was not written to unbelievers. And the book of 1 John is all about fellowship. We see this in chapter 1 and verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that she also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now in 1 John 1, 9, it reads, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, of course, this is not talking about eternal salvation. Eternal salvation is based 100% on what Jesus did at the cross. He died, was buried, and rose again. And you don't have to confess your sins to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The whole point of 1 John 1, 9 is to restore a believer back to fellowship with God in their experience. The fellowship is in the gospel. Like I said, John says that truly our fellowship is with the Father. Right? Even Jack, Jack Smack himself reads this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you already have fellowship. God, all, God always has fellowship with you. But do you know this, or are you trying to earn the fellowship that you already possess? Philippians 1 verse 3 reads, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ back to fellowship with God in their experience. It has nothing to do with forensic or judicial restoration which took place at the cross. These people are correct for claiming that, but see, they also want to deny the whole point of 1 John 1, 9. And like I said, you don't have to confess your sins at all when it comes to salvation, but after a person is saved, they have the option of confessing their sins. If you're confessing sins to earn fellowship with God, you are trying to merit favor with God, that is, living by law, not by faith. Confessing their sins, and yet these hyper-grace preachers out there dissuade that. And I believe the main reason anyone subscribes to this hyper-grace movement is because they're a bunch of lazy, sorry, idle Christians who don't want to do anything. Yep. Pick up your shovel, be miserable like Cain and the other son, and get to work. Or get called lazy by Jack Smack. It's a lose-lose. You are lazy. You are lazy is what the Pharaoh, the hard taskmaster, told the Israelites who kept putting burdens on them. Man is the one who puts burdens. Jesus takes all the burden away. Who don't want to do anything. They don't want to earn rewards. And they don't care about their Christian walk whatsoever. And see, that's their prerogative. Nobody's forcing anyone to do anything. The Bible simply encourages Christian service, and it's totally volitional. So that's all I have. The conclusion is this. When it comes to hyper-grace regarding salvation, I agree 100%. You don't need any works to be saved. You don't have to use 1 John 1, 9 to be saved. You don't need to be a disciple to be saved. You don't need to worry about chastisement or earning rewards to be saved. However, if someone wants to confess their sins and use 1 John 1, 9, if they want to be a disciple, if they want to earn rewards and avoid chastisement, and to daily serve God and even be a soul winner, that's their prerogative as well. And we don't need any type of preacher, grace or otherwise, discouraging this. So that's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank the conclusion of the matter is this. If you have a thirst to serve God, then by all means do it. If you don't have it that thirst, then don't serve God. That's perfectly fine too. God does not need us. We're as grass.
If you think God needs us, then you have a high view of man. God will send whomever he wants, an angel or someone else. All it took was one angel to preach the gospel to the whole earth, according to Revelation. I've heard it best said, I don't have to work for a treat, nor am I afraid of being punished. I'm fine. I do serve the Lord, but I'm not motivated by any of those things. And I'm not going to tell people that's why they need to serve the Lord, nor am I going to tell them they need to serve the Lord. I'm going to keep dishing out the riches of the feast. That's all I have. See you.